Don't cut into my time. I have only 45 minutes. First of all, I'm delighted to be here. I know I am in Florida. The sun is shining. We had a great race this morning. Everything is doing well. I am happy to see so many of you here. Dr. Sell, my congratulations to your leadership in progressively and courageously moving towards the treatment of choice for chronic diseases, which is plant-based whole food diet. Also, my, uh, my uh, sincere uh, thank you to Dr. Kirshner, who talked about the idea of uh, ecology. He talked about the idea of ethics. He talked about the idea of, yes, he covered all of them very well, planetary survival. And I want to add now something that will help all of these areas, how to manage your overweight. But I want to go beyond this. I want to show you how you can reverse obesity. Any takers here? Anybody try to lose weight? You're in the right place. You never will try another diet because this is going to be the last approach and it's a lifestyle medicine approach. All you have to do is aim for health and the scale will take care of itself. Did you get that one? Don't become terrorized and terrorized by the scale. Put it away. Maybe once in a while you look at it and say, I knew it was working. Okay. So my topic today is, if you want to lose weight, you have to eat more. You can go for that? Okay, let me tell you what's happening. Do you see the cha three chairs? Do we have the chairs there? I want to show you three chairs, and they're all pretty much the same width. 1900, 1930, 1970. And suddenly, 1990, the chairs all of a sudden become larger. Why? Because they had too much lumber to utilize in the Northwest. So they're just the larger chairs, right? No. Wrong. No, we need the larger chairs. Is the signal there? No. Again, let me highlight this. 1985, it was difficult to find obesity in our society. Less than 8% of the people. Five years later, in this country, it was 13% of all the adults that were obese. Five years later, it was 18%. Five years later, it was 23%. Five years later, it was 28%. And now, more than 30% of the adults in America are obese. Not just overweight, obese. Which means 72% of the people are either overweight or obese. This is a new epidemic. What happened? It, did somebody put something into the water? What happened? Tell me. Help me. And whenever you have obesity to worry about, you are, this is a weight, this is a gateway to all the obese, the, 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 the chronic diseases. You have to worry about diabetes, seven times more common in obese people. You have to worry about hypertension, five times more uh, common in obese people. You have to worry about heart disease, you have to worry about strokes, you have to worry about arthritis, you have to worry about asthma, you have to worry about sleep apnea, you have to worry about the different adult cancers. Obesity is the gateway to the chronic diseases. We've got to do something about it. It's a serious issue. And besides, when you look at obese people, Every extra pound above the ideal weight shaves off one month of life. It's not only the gateway to chronic diseases, but also it shortens your lifespan. You're 50 pounds overweight, that's 50 months. That's four years. Plus you have to worry about all these diseases. So this is a real issue. This is a heavy topic. This is a weighty matter. Are you with me there? Okay. Now. Here's my question, but before I say that, I want to make a statement. I want you to relax. Nobody's going to put a guilt trip on you today. You can be all winners. No more notches on your belt of failure. The last approach to 
becoming a winner in a losing game. Are you ready for this? Okay, here's a statement. You are not responsible for being overweight. I thought you would applaud. How many of you believe this? Let me see your hands. A couple of courageous people. Let me, let me rephrase this. Because I know you think I'm setting a trap, right? And you're right. How, how many of you believe that you are not solely responsible for being overweight and obese? All of you should have your hands. Okay. If I had a little more time, I would ask you, and if you had some roving mice, I would ask you, who then is responsible? Well, we take some responsibility, but, but who else is responsible? The amount of sugar in the diet. Okay, well, who else is responsible for being overweight? What's that again? Fast food. Very good. Okay, let me, let me just summarize it for you. Uh, how about uh, uh, our lifestyle? Lack of exercise, right? Do you see this one? Is it there? Number two, what about uh, upbringing? You know, we have been brought, brought up. I was, after the war in Germany, I was there. And my mother wanted to make sure that we kids would eat all of our food. And she would say, if you don't finish your plate, all the children in Ethiopia will be dying. And we immediately finish the food. Now you are 50 years of age. The food is on your plate. You're kind of full. But somehow the tapes kick in. Finish your food, finish your food. All the children in China are going to be dying, right? Psychological reasons. Upbringing, breastfeeding. Breastfeeding protects you from becoming overweight as, a, as a, you know, the offspring, of course. And because you can create billions of excess cells, fat cells, when you are not breastfeeding, but you're pushing the bottle and it doesn't control things as well. What about emotional reasons? Why do people eat? Why not just put away from the table? I mean, why are these people so fat? Why do they have any willpower? It's not that easy. It's not a matter of willpower. It's much more complicated. People eat for different reasons. They eat for boredom. They eat for being overwhelmed. They eat for being stressed. They eat for celebration. You know, when the Tampa Lightning hockey team wins, yes, let's celebrate. When they lose, let's celebrate. <laughs> we give ourselves all kinds of reasons, don't we? So emotions are big, big time. I remember this lady, she came to me and she said, uh, I'm upset. I'm upset with my husband. He is now why, and I'm here in Michigan, and it's winter time. Why couldn't he take me along to the devil convention there? It was 11 o'clock. She enters her bedroom. She stands in front of the big mirror. She begins to disrobe. And all of a sudden, she faces the naked truth. And she becomes so scared for a second there, she lets it all hang out. It gets worse. Then, what do you think she does next? She turns the light off. <laughs> and then what does she do? She goes downstairs. There's a freezer. There's a compartment up there. You know the story. It comes out nice and smooth and silken and cool. She puts everything on that she can find, everything, including the maraschino cherry on top. And now, ah, I deserve it. She goes to bed and she says, I'm okay. Until the next morning, what happens then? She kicks herself. I violated my code of honor. I wanted to surprise my husband. I wanted to lose three pounds. Look, it didn't last, right? Emotions, emotions, emotions. And there are many, many other reasons. What about advertising? Do you realize that uh, McDonald's is spending $800 million 
to seduce you and they're succeeding, many of them fall for the lion. Do you realize how Kellogg is spending just for one brand $40 million to eat their sugar laden cereals, which are rarely cereals, they're usually candy by nutritional standards? Then you have a book called, how many of you have seen the book Salt, Sugar, and Fat? Do you realize? that it's not that easy to just look at a person that is carrying extra weight and look at them with judgmental eyes. It's much more complicated. That can be abuse in childhood. Where now, obesity becomes a protection rather than something that you want to lose. You want to keep it there to keep the adversive experiences away from you that you have suffered through when you were young. Very complicated things. You have to be very loving to people regardless of the extra pounds that may separate them from you. Are you with me there? Caring, acknowledging, kindness goes a long way. Here's a classic. Two years ago, Michael Moss, a very prominent, serious, Pulitzer Prize winning author, wrote the book, Salt, Sugar, and Fat. And he details out by interviewing retired executives of international companies that are excelling in processing food. And he points out that these companies, many of them owned by Philip Morris, the tobacco giant, have gone to the largest brain research center in the world and asked, how much sugar do I need to put into this product so people become addicted? How much fat do I have to put into this product so people become addicted? How much salt do I have to put into the, po the potato chips so, and the Pringles so that it's very true. Once you pop it, you can't stop it. Have you ever tried to eat one Pringle? Have you ever tried to eat one M&M? Have you ever tried to eat one all Oreos? It's impossible. Why? Because you have no willpower. Wrong! Oh, that might be part of it sometimes. But you see, you don't feel good until you finish the whole thing. Right? Because the sugar and the fat and the salt content have been calibrated to be exactly there to hit the pleasure center of the brain and to hijack the brain waves and you have very little choice. So you begin to realize that in the few minutes that I have, I just want to highlight a few of these ideas, that obesity is a very, very complex issue, especially when it comes to understanding the reasons why we're obese. <clears throat> now you see, this is what happened. 1975, McDonald's started the fast food craze. And it changed the culture, it changed the society, and when the culture changes, obesity is very difficult to handle because you become what the culture is like. Is that true? You hang out with, with large friends, you become large. You hang out with smokers, you become a smoker. You hang out with lean people, and chances are you're becoming lean too. True or false? It's all well documented scientifically. This is what we eat. Can you see this? 50% of the calories that we eat in America today are from processed, engineered foods. They're made for profit. And they're high usually in sugar or salt or fat or all two or three of those. That's 50% of what we eat comes from these sources. Number two, the 26 and 9%, this is the amount of animal products that we consume. 35% of the calories comes from animal products. Dairy, eggs, meat, chicken, fish, and so on. These are the cholesterol carrying foods. These are the foods that are high in saturated fat. These are the foods that cause the liver to go to overdrive in producing excessive amounts of cholesterol. And then on top of that, they still have their own cholesterol, so it swells up, and that's why we have a problem. Number one factor in heart disease, high cholesterol numbers. When I go to China, in the villages there, the cholesterol levels are 90 to 100 to 110, 120. Here in America, we're happy if we're getting down to 200. When I went to school, we said up to 300 is normal. We have very high numbers, even the so-called normals are much, much too high. 
because in our society, every third person dies from heart disease and from strokes. We didn't have this disease 100 years ago. This is a new epidemic. So let me give you five uh, principles, but first let me mention this here. Calories in, calories out. If you have more calories going into the system than going out of the system, what happens? Where do they go? They go into the fat bank, right? The central fat bank right here, right? They're accumulating there. And after a while, it becomes so full, it doesn't know where to go anymore, so it establishes branch offices in different parts of the body. And then you realize that you have an appointment coming up, some family reunion, 50 year or 30 year uh, school reunion, and you need to lose that fat fast. What are you gonna do? You go to the power line in the supermarket, and there are all the magazines, right? Lose 15 pounds in seven days. You know, just drink this tea and go into the bathtub and you will just melt off. And you are subject to the merchants of misery. That fat, that extra weight came on very slowly in most cases. Most people gain one pound after they've turned 18 years of age. You're 50 years of age, you probably have gained 30, 32 pounds. Some more, some less, on the average. So you've gained this weight, usually, gradually, progressively, slowly, most of the time, but you won't have an instantaneous answer and you're subject to being hijacked. It will not work. We're looking for quick answers to slow developing diseases. You want to lose weight slowly one to two pounds a week. So if you want to lose 50 pounds, think of one year. And all you have to do is eat more food and you lose 50 pounds. Any takers? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was a pretty sparse, oh, come on. Any takers of losing 50 pounds in one year and you can eat more food? Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Now you see, every time that you take some extra calories, they accumulate, if you have your calories all taken care of for the day, and then you have one more slice of apple pie. I mean, it's not even a la mode. I mean, you're very <laughs> right on target, right? But you know, that's, that's 500 calories extra. If you do this for seven days during that week, seven times 500, that's 3,500 calories. That means you would have gained one pound of fat, chicken, like yellow looking fat, slimy. It's there, it's there. And your surgeons, they hate it because it's very difficult to negotiate the surgical things when everything is slippery, right? So remember, calories do count, but we don't want you to count calories. This is the beauty of the CHIP program. We have 80,000 people that have followed this program. And there's no problem there. These people are, they've gone, to a different level. They said, we have never eaten so much in our lives and we're losing weight. Do you want to hear the rest of the story? Okay. So whenever you have 3,500 calories in excess accumulated, that means you have usually gained one pound of fat. Okay. And so when that happens, the first thing, when you get the evil eye from your spouse or from someone, how about that weight? First thing is you say, I got to go on a diet. Let all diets die. Diets have no place in a successful weight management program. Eat for health and the scale will take care of itself. Yes, that's right. Let all diets die. What you need is a new lifestyle that you can live with for the rest of your life. So, because when you begin to try to eat less, fewer calories, what, ha what happens usually? You have to count calories, you're on these starvation diets, uh, you are uh, worried about serving size, and you have hunger pangs, and afterwards, uh, it's not for me, I can't do it. I just don't have the will. It must be my glands. <laughs> Could it be the salivary glands? <laughs> or people come to me and say, you know, I don't understand it. I mean, I eat like a bird, and I'm losing, I, I cannot lose weight. I'm just, I said, what kind of a bird are you? <laughs> are you a vulture? So then people say, well, okay, this, this uh, hunger thing doesn't work very well for me. I saw the biggest loser. What do they do? Exercise. 
So now we exercise, right? Does that work? Yeah. Sure it does, doesn't it? It seems that you are sort of ambivalent about this. What about, should we all exercise to lose weight? Let me see your hands. Yeah. It doesn't make any difference. How many of you say yes to that? Okay, let me tell you a little story. So I have these two uh, lovely ladies uh, uh, in where I, I'm working in Loma Linda, a small town, university town in Southern California. That's where the CHIP program is headquartered too. CHIP, actually, you know what CHIP stands for, right? Actually, it's, we thought of the cheap health program, but we didn't know how to spell cheap, so we spelled C-H-I-P. Okay. So they come to me and they say, we would like to lose weight, but we don't want to change our diet. Oh, okay, so what are you going to do? Oh, we want to exercise. I said, okay. So I, want, so I mapped it all out very, very carefully. You can do it mathematically. I said, I want you to walk from the university from the medical center to Stato Brothers, the store there. That's 1.1 mile. And that means you burn about 110 calories, calories. And then I want you to go back, of course. And I want you to have a partner, okay? Yeah, we're doing it together. A, a, accountability structures. So 220 mile, uh, calories you burn every day. Yes, sir. After four months, they come back. It doesn't work. We have gained weight. I said, did you walk every day? No. We walked six days a week. I said, that's perfect. That's fine. So you walk every day, and um, you walk together, and you are verifying that this is true. Yes, it is true, sir. Okay. And you have done this from the medical center to Stato Brothers, and you go back six times a week. Yes, sir. And you haven't changed your diet. Yes, sir. We have not. There's something fishy here. I said, let me see if I, if I understand this. So you leave the medical center, you walk to State of Brothers, and then do you go inside? Oh, yes. And what do you do there? Oh, we have a Krispy Kreme donut. I mean, we have been so good. We burned all these calories. We deserve a treat, don't we? So we have the energy to go back. And I said, well, how long do you enjoy this kind of a crispy cream donut? Oh, you know, about five minutes, but the memories linger on. I said, so you have some enjoyable experience for five minutes. Is it really worth it? Because you've gained weight. Because the crispy cream donut is 420 calories, and you just burn 220. Of course, you gain every time you walk, you gain 200 calories. I said, is it really worth it? And one lady says, Oh yes, doctor, really? <laughs> so if you want to have that, uh, <laughs> if you want to burn the calories of one Super Coke with fries and Big Mac, you have to walk seven hours. <laughs> Losing weight with walking and exercise is not the way to go. I mean, you have to be retired or you have to take vacation time to burn off that extra. Don't have those burgers. Don't have those calories. Don't have that apple pie. Can't do it. It is much more important to let go of the foods that we eat that are high in caloric density. That's a key. Okay? I mean, you can eat a piece of a, a, a carrot cake, or you can eat uh, 66 carrots, which would fill you up. Tell me. Okay, so, but, so we, re we, we recommend to you, eat more food, eat more whole food, the food that comes out of the hand of a master designer. What nature has provided, you can eat all you want, you cannot gain weight unless you add a lot of sugar and a lot of oil and grease to it. Simple foods, simply prepared, you can eat all you want because you can only put four cups of food into that stomach. And when they're stopping this full, it's full. It shuts down the apostat up there, and you're fine. And you feel glorious. Winning the game. And it's not just that you take care of your weight, but you take also care of your overall health, and you reduce your food bill by 35 to 45 percent. Because you now eat potatoes instead of potato chips. Okay, let me give you some examples. Five principles. Five principles. Number one, empty calories. What are empty calories? No nutritional content, right? Just calories. Taste and calories. Seductive taste. 
created in order to seduce you, in order to give you this special hit up in the pleasure center, and you are powerless. Right? Okay. So reduce empty calories. Empty calories are found in sugar, no nutritional value, just calories. 16% of what we eat today, 16% of the calories, sugar. No nutrition value. Let it go. Cut back on it. Number two, fats, oil, and grease. No nutrition value. Olive oil, no nutrition value. But we always thought that olive oil is good. Olive oil is, if you're struggling with overweight, whether it's olive oil or butter or anything else, it's always every gram is nine calories. I don't know where people get this idea that olive uh, oil has some kind of a medicinal value. It's a refined food. It's extracted from the olive. Eat the olive, don't extract it. So oil, grease, and fat represent 24 calories. But first let me show you the sugar consumption. We're consuming nowadays about 30 to 40 teaspoons of sugar per person per day. No nutrition value. You have three soda pops, right there you have 30 teaspoons of sugar. And people think nothing of it. Most of the sugar that we eat comes from soda pop. But you also have some of the donuts, and that's what we always recommend for people to aim for the center of the donut. <laughs> and then my, somebody told me, well, but they sell those holes now too, so I think can't win. Okay. This is a German chocolate cake, 15 teaspoons of sugar, a banana split, 25 teaspoons. And it goes down so easily, but it kicks you in the butt afterwards, doesn't it? This is not, uh, this is what we give to our children. I mean, come on. I mean, this is 52% sugar. I gave a presentation in Battle Creek one time. I should have been smarter. Because that's the headquarters of Kellogg's, right? And I chose this kind of example there. And, you know, I said, this is 52% sugar. And the man stands up in the back and he said, Sir, I protest. This is wrong. I'm the vice president of marketing at Kellogg's. This is only 48% sugar. <laughs> yeah. And you see, the people that can least afford these kind of foods, they buy them. I mean, look, they could have bought all the Quaker oats there. They're very, very cheap, maybe a couple of dollars, but they buy the fr fr fruit uh, loops, and then you pay not $12, the equivalent for the grain that is in these fruit loops. It's all a matter of education, education, education. And you don't jam it down people's throat. You just find ways to create an opening and then you gently drop the pearl into a receptive hand. We always tell our chip people, chip people are always the nicest people, the most gentle people. They don't hammer people. They're not the food police. Oh yeah, they know that people kill themselves, but there's nothing you can do. You only can pray for them maybe, and you can lovingly approach them. That's all you can do. Especially your loved ones that you want to help so badly, right? These are the last ones, well, who are you? What do you know about this thing since, since when have you become a doctor? You know, it's that kind of a thing. So 20% of what we eat, actually more than 20%, 24% now, is fat, oil, and grease, no nutritional value. Please note, do you see those 40 years of corn? Before we could extract the corn oil and sell it as corn oil, if you wanted to eat one tablespoon of corn oil equivalent, you would have to eat 14 ears of corn. Do you see the wisdom of nature? Nature knows how to package food. You can never overeat on corn oil if you don't have the extracted type and you have to eat it in the original form like corn. Do you see? And then when you have corn oil available, then you can put it into corn chips. And one little bit of corn chips is 1,500, almost 1,500 calories. That's a half a pound of fat. And you can eat this in nine minutes or less. Think about it. This is what the culture does. You have seen those kind of foods? Pringles? Yeah. My medical students tell me they can finish one tube of Pringles in 13 minutes. And I said, you know how many calories? No clue. We don't take nutrition medical school. Okay. <laughs> how, many, how many calories in one tube of Pringles? 1,000 plus. And then I ask them, if you don't have Pringles and you would have to eat real potatoes, how many potatoes would you have to eat? No clue. Don't take nutrition class. What are we going to do? I said, you would have to eat nine, 10 potatoes to get the same number of calories that you have in one tube of Pringles. And remember, one third on top is not even filled. 
right? Yeah. <clears throat> so eat foods as it comes in nature and you don't have to worry so much. Of course, when you have that potato, that baked potato, be careful what you put inside, right? I mean, some people become sort of surgically involved <laughs> and all kinds of goodies disappear there. It becomes a, a grave uh, for calories. Be very careful. Just put in yesterday's lentil soup and you'll be okay. Why don't people think about this? It's always better the second day, isn't it? And you just want something moist. You don't need all this butter and sour cream and cheese and so on. And we don't want to talk about those kind of things. These are the combinations of, this is always sugar and fat, sugar and fat, sugar and fat. Taste, taste, taste. It's always compressed, small volume, large load of calories. One shake, one milkshake. Look at this. That's a big one. But then you have 2,000 calories. And people don't even remember that they had it as a snack because they think, what, had, what did I have this morning and this noon and tonight? Snacks? Oh, snacks count? Yes, snacks do count. 40% of all the calories in America come from snack foods. And these are not potato chip. No, no, I shouldn't say that. They're not uh, celery sticks. They're not carrot sticks. There are snacks that go into the system very easily and then you need to have a second one and sometimes a third one. Snacks. I tell people it's a corny little thing, but you know, think about it. Uh, the larger the snacks, the larger the slacks. <laughs> and then when you add calorie, you add uh, uh, alcohol to it, which again has no nutritional value, 44% of the American diet, 44% of the calories have no nutritional value and people are overfed and undernourished. We have a new form of undernourishment, of malnutrition in our society. We have all the food and we are malnourished because we eat the right, not the right foods. So that's principle number one, reduce empty calories. Number two, reduce animal products. You know, I feel I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the choir here, right? Because most of you are already on that wise, responsible track. Intelligent people. Making intelligent, responsible choices for the sake of the animals, for the sake of ecology, for the sake of climate change, um, and for planetary survival, and for health. So we're not, I'm not singing here uh, a song because I happen to be a vegan myself and I want to hammer my message home. If, there, if you were not at all into this kind of an orientation yet, I would tell you why. And that is, uh, most people don't understand that our animal products are very high in fat. As a matter of fact, 35% of all the fat that we eat comes from meat, poultry, and fish. And 31% of the salad oil and shortening is right there. Then you have dairy products, 15%. You see, the more fat you have in the diet, the more calories you take in because every gram of fat has nine calories. Every gram of starch is only four calories. So if you want to lose weight, cut back on fats, oil and grease. It's the most concentrated source of calories. And you say, well, but I need to have my protein, right? <laughs> so you look at the, the, the last one there on the, on the bottom, the sausage, uh, American hot dog. That hot dog is 15% protein and 85% is fat. And folks, you don't ever want to know what they put into these hot dogs. Any scrap you cannot sell disappears in that hot dog. I dare say, if I would give you the recipe that I have at home and I would send it to you, chances are you would never touch another hot dog. Or then you say, well, what? About, and by the way, I should tell you this. Uh, these processed meats are now recognized by the World Health Organization as being clearly identified as carcinogenic, the cancer causing, last October, a year and a half ago. Then you have uh, your uh, sirloin steak, and you say, well, I have to have my protein. Yeah, it's 25% protein. Hey, it's 75% fat. These meats are all high fat foods. Don't tell me they're high protein foods. Get some beans, you get plenty of protein. You never have to worry ever, ever to worry about protein if you're moving towards a vegetarian diet that is fairly well balanced, a vegan diet. As a matter of fact, most Americans take two times the amount of protein that we really need and it really burns out the kidneys and has many, many side effects. 
Look at what happened to the animal uh, consumption here. You see we have gone from 120 some pounds to 201 pounds in the last 100 years. This is what the average American meat eater consumes, 12 cows. I mean, I can't imagine this, 12 cows! I mean, from the lips to the tail, we eat the whole thing. And then you have 25 hogs, and you have 2,400 chickens, and you know how they're being raised nowadays? I mean, help, mercy. Mercy for the animals, mercy for our bodies. And then you look at cheese, <laughs> cheese is, 70% fat. Oh, it tastes good, no question about it. I used to love cheese. It was one of those things that I was willing to give up. It wasn't worth it. And please note that the cheese consumption has dramatically increased since 1975. What happened in 1975? The American people arose, rose up and they said, we don't want to have all the saturated fat in whole milk. We don't want to have whole milk, it's too dangerous. It's the same thing as if you had three Bacon strips, and that's saturated fat, and we all know that bacon is not in your best interest, right? So they said, we don't want this whole milk. Fine, no problem. We'll take the milk out, we give you blue water. They did. They give you 2%, then 1%, then blue water, anything you want. What do you think they did with all the fat that they skimmed off? They sent it to China? What did they do with that? They turned it into cheese. They turned it into cheese. And so cheese consumption has gone from four pounds to 34 pounds now per person per year. Cheese has become the number one source of saturated fat in the diet. Cheese contributes more to the high cholesterol than anything that you can eat in terms of animal products. It's high in salt, hypertension. It's high in fat, 70 some percent. It has cholesterol. No fiber. This is not an ideal food, even though the taste is very, very difficult to resist. Cheese. I mean, I can just imagine this uh, executive. He's at home, and he got the message, and he tells his wife, from now on, no more whole milk. Am I clear? He's an executive, right? He gives orders. Talks to his wife like this. Not a good way to do it, but that's what he does. Did you hear me? No more whole milk. It's loaded with saturated fat. I don't want it. Yes, sir. She's doing really well. Four months down the line, she forgets. She brings home some whole milk. He tries it. He says, what did you do? You brought half and half home now? Because you know, when you change the, the taste buds, whole milk tastes like half and half. And it's that told you, I only want to have skimmed milk. She's, what are you trying to do? Become a rich widow? No, pass me a cheeseburger. <laughs> he thinks he's smart. No more whole milk. Then he asks for a cheeseburger. He didn't get it, did he? So please note, when it comes to the fat in food, milk is about 50% fat. That's whole milk. Ice cream is 55%. Cheese is 70%. Cream cheese, I mean, cream cheese is 90% fat. You might as well eat Vaseline. I mean, it's 100%. <laughs> and then you have beef and pork, but be also careful with nuts. Nuts are about 80% fat. You want to eat nuts because they're very nutritious, but you want to always use small amounts. Nuts and avocados, wonderful foods, nutritional packages, par excellence. But you want to use them in small amounts, small amounts. And when you buy them, don't buy the salted ones, obviously, right? So, I want to so, eat less animal products because they're high in fat and also, the, of course, they have the cholesterol and they have no fiber. So I want to take you now to Lomolina, where I'm at. Uh, in Southern California. This is the headquarters also, the scientific headquarters of the Adventist Church. You know, the Adventist people are sort of a, mm, a denomination uh, that are very uh, Bible-centered. Um, they, they have a very good social network. Uh, they go to church fairly regularly, most of these people, once a week. So um, uh, they're also, they don't use alcohol and they don't use, they don't smoke. Amen. 
So these are all good things, right, to, to, to do and to have. But the Adventists, uh, they found, in a huge study, they found that about 10% of the Adventists are vegans, and about 30% of them are lacto-ovo-vegetarians, and then 10% of them are fish-eating vegetarians, and uh, 50% of them are meat eaters. And the government said, look, we have $25 million for you if you apply for the grant and you do a study on these Adventists. If you enroll 100,000 people and you know that some of these people are vegetarians and some of them are not, is there a dietary related health outcome that's different? Who lives the longest? Who has the least disease of these different groups? So I said, okay. All of these Adventists don't smoke. All of these Adventists don't use alcohol or not supposed to, I guess. And these Adventists, there are church goers, you know, fairly regularly. They don't just go once a year, they go every week. They take micro vacations once a week. They have a good social network, all of the bridges help for. And here's what they found. They found, you see the red bar, that these are Adventist women when compared to women in the green color there that are vegans. The Adventist meat eaters weigh 40 pounds more than the Adventist vegans. The same thing for men. The Adventist men that meet our consumers weigh 30 pounds more than the Adventists that are vegans. So if you want to lose weight, what's the best way to go? Yeah, move towards a vegetarian and ideally a vegan diet. What about nuts? Be a little careful with nuts. I mean, just look at this. Uh, one small container of planters mixed nuts. You know, you finish that little thing. That's a half a pound of fat on your torso. So be careful with nuts, okay? I always tell our chip people, buy the nuts in the shell as they come, and all you get is a rock. And you will not overeat on nuts, because you've got to open them up for the activity. So, <clears throat> people then come to me and say, okay, so cut back on empty calories, cut back on our products, is there anything left to eat? Well, you know better than that, right? And you know, you have fruits, whole grains, legumes, and vegetables. They're all very, very, very low in calories and very high in nutritional value. These are the foods that nature has presented us as a gift to use. They come out of the hand of a master designer. Folks, these are the foods that don't need nutritional labels. If I boil it down to a couple of rules to be healthy and to lose weight, avoid foods that have nutritional labels as a general rule. And number two, avoid foods that have danger labels attached. Like when you go to the meat area, you buy some chicken, they always tell you be careful, bacteria and so on. This is the kind of foods that we recommend. Whole wheat products, not the refined white flour products. Legumes, there are 50 kinds of different beans. They're excellent. Lentils. You have fruits and you have vegetables. And you have some nuts and you have some seeds, some avocado. So let me give you just a few uh, final samples uh, to illustrate my point. This is a Newton uh, fig little bar. I asked my medical students, how many uh, can you eat? Oh, they said, we can eat them. The whole package, I said, no, just one square. How many calories? No clue. I said, okay, 60 calories. I mean, you could have eaten a, a quarter of a cantaloupe, which is making you full more. The cantaloupe or that little square. One piece of uh, apple pie, not even a la mode, about 500 calories. You could have eaten five apples. On a hot, on a cold day, baked apple would be nice, wouldn't it? Then you have the happy hour there at the medical convention. You have some vodka, you have a little bit of a few nuts, that's 740 calories. You could have eaten five pounds of fruits and vegetables. And most people have two shots of vodka, right? They could have eaten 10 pounds of fruits and vegetables and still not have the same number of calories. Now this is my grandson there. People always ask me, uh, is there a stove underneath it? I said, no. <laughs> so you said no more cheeseburgers? Well, you need to really think about this. This is a thousand calories. You could have had four and portobello burgers with eggplant. You see, I'm trying to reach people where they are. If you're a vegan, you don't have to worry about this anymore, right? Because the thing is all boiling down to one basic principle. If you have a lot of fiber in your food, then the fiber fills you up, the roughage is there. You know that principle. But you know, the American diet has about 10 grams of fiber. We should probably have 40 or 50 grams to be in good health. 
If you have 40, 50 grams of health, you never have to read the Reader's Digest in the bathroom. You don't sit there for two, for two hours and try to produce something. No, you go in, you're out, you're done. That's what fiber does, okay? So, the final point here is this. The principle, the most important cause of overweight is not overeating, but the reliance on heavily marketed, calorically dense foods. Small volume, large number of calories. The main culprit in overweight is not food volume, but caloric density. Two more principles, one minute each. How about exercise? Well, of course we recommend exercise. You know, I ran this morning with, with some 150 other people. We had a great time out there. Uh, of course we exercise not to lose weight. That's not the main reason, but to just be good health and to enjoy life. That's what we do. That's what exercise does. Lots and lots of things, but not just strictly for losing weight. It's too difficult. Sensitive. We have enrolled thousands and thousands of people in a CHIP program, and these people are different people. They become different people. They enjoy life, their fog lifts, their blood pressure goes down, their diabetes medications are gone, the angina begins to diminish, and, 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 and. And then my daughter comes to me, she's a psychologist, she says, Dad, you're doing it all wrong. I said, I beg your pardon? Dad, you're doing it all wrong. She said, Dad, don't you know about ACE? What's A's? A, C, E. You put these large women and men into the CHIP program, wrong idea. I said, what do you mean? They need it more than anybody else. She says, wrong idea, Dad. They have high A, C, E scores. That means, adversive childhood events. Dad, do you realize that many of these women in particular have been abused as children, and maybe sometimes by their husbands, and usually sexually. I mean, not all, but she said many. Dad, weight to them is a solution. It's not the problem. We just send them first to a group therapy program to let go of all the pain that has been storing there for years. Unless you take care of this, they cannot take care of the weight. Listen to your kids. Sometimes they're right on. So in closing, take care of your weight. It's a gateway to the chronic diseases. It shortens your life. It gives is a psychological burden for most people. But don't fall into the traps of the merchants of misery. Be sensitive. Be sensible. Make wise decisions. Aim for one to two pounds at best per week to lose weight because it came on gradually and it should come off gradually. Because otherwise you may not even realize who you are after a few months. Because you still have this image. I'm fat and you cannot pass by or pass through two cars because you still think you're 350 pounds but you're now 125. Oh, I can give the body a chance give the brain a chance to catch up so that self-image and reality can fuse. It has been a real pleasure being with you here and I wish you all the very best.